itself. Hey everybody, Dr. Mike Dusa here with a very special guest, MT, MTFU Longevity Podcast. How are you tonight? Uh, my friend Rick Collins, uh, many of you, many, many, many of you know who he is, uh, his prominence in the industry. Some of you may not. Uh, some of you may need his services uh, in good ways and sometimes not so good ways, although they hopefully turn out to be the best ways. Uh, uh, Rick is known as America's lawyer for the bodybuilding, fitness, and dietary supplement industries. But I also describe Rick, attorney Rick Collins, uh, as an iconoclast, meaning a person who doesn't really necessarily adhere to societal norms because he's a man of many compartments. He does a lot of different things. Um, he, he, he went to school, he got a full ride, went to Hofstra, he was this big muscular bodybuilder, and especially back then, I know Rick is at least around my age, so maybe 70s, 80s, bodybuilding and weightlifting was not very popular, so right away you were looked at as perhaps not as bright as other people in school would be, but of course Rick got a full ride because he was very, very smart and brilliant in many ways, and <clears throat> top of the class, all that, uh, and he was also a competitive bodybuilder. Uh, one of the top lawyers now for the industries I also mentioned. I might even throw in, uh, I, can't, I can't really prove this, maybe one of the most muscular and strongest uh, lawyers in America. I don't know. <laughs> you know, you could say, I, listen, Rick, I can call myself Mr. Universe. doesn't mean it's true. I can say right. what I want. Um, right. He just relinquished his position of uh, presidency of his local bar. Uh, he's a um, uh, published author, Legal Muscle, Alpha Male Challenge. That's the longevity stuff, folks. So we'll talk a little bit about that. He's also been in the movies. He still acts occasionally. So listen, he, he has done so many different things. I'm always impressed. And I'm always happy to have a person like this around me. Uh, face it, I work in a room right now, even with COVID, everybody's locked up. And you'll always hear in business and industry, uh, you want to be the dumbest person in the room, meaning you want to be around people who are smarter and further ahead of you. That's tough in the bodybuilding industry because many people are well, uh, ruled by ego, so they won't relinquish that, and they won't learn from really smart guys like Rick and, and those who are accomplished. But we're very, very fortunate to have these people around us. And even though I'm in this room every day, I get to talk to people who I read about in books and see on TV. And we've been really lucky because nobody has told me no yet, although somebody probably will. But Rick, thanks, thanks for being here. I know you're really busy. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for having me, Doc. Uh, I we did a, uh, a written interview probably five years ago. I had a great time with it, and um, and it's good to see you actually on camera, and to do it this way is even better. I'm not a hologram. I'm still alive. Uh, I see that. Uh, <laughs> and you look well. <laughs> oh, thanks, man. I'm doing okay. Denise told me to wear the Aquaman shirt tonight. You know, because I, cool. like, I was, like I was telling you, uh, believe me, it's, it's one of those form fitting so you're not going to see the bottom part it doesn't look so right. good right now okay and you know she's assistant ag so she was psyched that i had you know the esteemed attorney collins she knows all about you she competed years ago and you know she likes it when i'm i'm hanging with the more erudite people i mean she likes everyone but she says you know, michael you're going to raise your game a little tonight because you have to you. talking to well, rick tell her i said hello and thank you oh no i will i will for sure rick so, so tell us how you started you grew up in the east coast and you started training and what happened from there how did you end up here just in a short form you know it's funny that you say you, you mentioned aquaman right because <laughs> i have a theory i have a theory that bodybuilders of our era and it may not be true anymore but but of, of our age most of us started out our original inspiration for training was comic book superheroes Yes. And whether it was whether it was Aquaman or it was Daredevil or Superman or Batman, whatever it was. And I remember as a kid, you know, as a young, young teen kind of, you know, going looking through comic books and, and growing up with comic books. As this was obviously before all the other you know new media was out. And um, and just I guess it was kind of the combination of the of the wanting to do good, sort of the, the inspiration of being the good guy, like a, like a, a superhero type and that was kind of tied with this sort of hyper muscularity. Cause if you remember, you know, the comic book heroes, I mean, huge rippling pecs oh, yeah. and, and massive triceps. And I remember the way these, these artists would draw. And I was actually an artist. I was voted most artistic in, in my high school class, believe it or not. And, um, and my too. medium was kind of ink. It was pen and ink, and, and a lot of what I drew were these sort of hyper-muscular characters. And I think that that was 
the, at least for me, that was an inspiration to really start training. And I got into training probably when I was 14, 15, um, by 16, I was, I was definitely, you know, lifting, uh, by 17, I remember, I think I had a 17 inch arm when I was 17 and that was like, you know, oh, yeah. a big deal yeah, for yeah. Me at the time. Right. So, oh yeah. Uh, did you, did you pick up, uh, did you pick up the Sears, uh, sand plastic weight set? Did you have one of those? My cousin, Donnie, he, my cousin, Donnie took me to Sears and, um, and I still probably have some of the plates around those, those blue vinyl sand filled oh, yeah. weights, you know, with the, with the skinny bar and, and two dumbbells mm -hmm. and a, a bench that probably wouldn't support more than 90 pounds, you know, and, uh, exactly. and, and that's where I started at home. And, um, and uh, it just, it, it took off from there. I, I, I was genetically well, um, you know, well suited for bodybuilding and uh, I started putting some size on and then I, I never turned back. And um, and I got into you know, more and more serious. I joined a gym, started training at um, first gym I trained at was uh, Pumping Iron in Queens Village in, in Queens. Oh, nice. And um, it was. Which... Hey, Rick, I got to stop you. Don't don't you wish don't you wish a place like that was still open now? That's hardcore. But, you know, I'm lucky enough to train now at Bev's. And you know, Steve and Bev are great, and and I. I oh, no, no, Rick, Rick, no, I'm not. I'm not slighting those gyms. I'm saying, wouldn't you like to know a place like that still exists? You know. Yeah, they, they they those really really sort of hole in the wall places don't. I remember seeing the biggest guy I think I'd ever seen when I was like 17, 18 years old. You may not. I don't know if you remember this name, Harold Poole. Oh, of course, remember Harold Poole. Yeah, I uh, came in. I uh, was in the first Mr. Olympia. I think second to Larry Scott, something like that. Yeah, yeah, he was great. So he walked into Pump and Iron when I was like 17 years old and, and just like triceps like hams hanging off the back of his arm. And I was like, you know, couldn't believe what I was seeing. And that inspired me that, you know, this is possible. And I was going to gonna keep pushing and, and keep training. And, um, and I did. And ultimately, when I was in college, I competed in bodybuilding. So I was a bodybuilder long before I was a lawyer. You know, bodybuilding was in my blood from a very early age. And I did I did well. I have a bunch of trophies collecting dust at home and uh, competed in some NPC shows, some college shows. Um, loved doing it. And um, and then um, and it was after that that I went to law school. Rick, um, you mentioned John Defendus is here. We'll talk about his gym in a second. He's, he's saying hello. You know, John. He, I do uh, know John. Yeah. Hey, John. How are you? I, I don't know if you. I don't know if you had the pleasure of training with Mahalik back then. Uh, I I trained. I trained sometime. I, I don't know if John. I'm, I'm sure John knew um, uh, a lot of the people who um, were involved in um, uh, Mahalik's back in the day. There was a guy named Ali Ramalu that um, I, 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 John may recognize the name. I think he was a manager, a day manager at Mahalix at one time. Talking, he had seen me. Mr. America's gym? Yeah, at Mr. America's at Mahalix yeah, yeah. in Farmingdale. Um, and, um, and Sean Perrine, who oh, later yeah. became, you, you know Sean, Sean yeah. became the uh, editor-in-chief of, uh, of Muscle and Fitness and Flex. And, did he um, pass away recently, uh, Rick? He did. He passed a few years ago. He was a great guy. Such a he nice guy. Such very a nice close friend of mine. Nice, like, really. I'm sorry. Fantastic. Thank you. Fantastic guy. And and he and I had some some workouts at Mahalix. And Mahalix was just an amazing gym at the time. And John Defendus was a guy that you know I looked up to tremendously. And uh, there are legends. I'm sure you know John. You know would say some of them are true and some of them are not about the just the maniacal workouts that he and, and Steve Mahalik had there but they're they're legendary to this day Rick we're going to talk about PEDs and I think you're a lot like me I I don't I don't like to say I don't care about anything those three words like for instance I, I wouldn't hire a person who has that attitude I don't I think everything must be afforded concern and consideration but, you know, I don't really use that in my calculus of judging a person. But, of course, it's part of your business, so we'll talk about it. So when I mentioned comic books, I was big in them, too. One of my best friends uh, might be on here. His name's Ron Garney. He's a Marvel comic book artist. He's one of the top guys. And we've talked about it. And um, it, you're right. When we were kids, you'd look at these guys, and you couldn't believe how big they were drawn. 
And at the time, it was Arnold, it was Zane. You know, they, they were tremendous, but they didn't look like the comics. Now you've got bodybuilders who actually look like they could be those same. You can't warp them more by drawing them. Right. right. <laughs> you know, and, and we're yeah. talking life about... Has, life has come to imitate art after all of these years. Uh, it, it's true. It's true. And, you know, I'm going to jump. I'm just going to speak grandly here, and you can maybe put the details in. Everyone would always say something like, well, if Arnold was doing all the gear today that they have, he'd be much bigger and better. I don't know if that's true. I, I don't know if it's the, the greater amounts of food, the, you know, the training, the technology. You, you know, you're leveraging. You, for instance, as a bodybuilder, maybe you'd agree. I, I'm not, Denise told me to stop saying I'm sure you'll agree because that's like I'm telling people to agree. But maybe you'll agree <laughs> that. Subtle hint. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Counselor, get out. Um if you had all the knowledge you had when you were, you know, when you were competing and you were able to leverage it today and you still had the, you know, the youth and the physicality, you'd probably be a lot better, right? Probably, yeah. I would yeah. hope I would hope that we learn as we grow and as time goes on and uh, you know, I do some things differently in many aspects, but yeah, I think I think I would probably uh, have come along further. You know, I had an opportunity, you know, there was some, you know, talk about you know, what I would do as my competing was going well. And, you know, what am I going to do? I, bodybuilding was in my, my blood. And should I continue competing? Should I try to get a pro card? And at that time, it was very, very difficult. Very hard. I mean, forget about it. So, I mean, where, where am I going with this? And I ultimately decided, you know what? I'm going to go to law school. I'm going to stop competing. I'm going to go in this in this other direction. And um, and so I kind of stepped away from competing and stepped away from bodybuilding, so to speak, at that time as I became an assistant district attorney. So I was a prosecutor like like Denise. So uh, so I did that for five years when I finished law school. But it's ironic, I guess, that after the years went by, I'm probably more involved in bodybuilding than I ever would have been had I just continued, you know, competing in in regional shows or something like that. Um, you you kind of came, I came full circle to where I belonged because I ultimately I worked with Ben Weeder. Uh, I became counsel wow. to the IFBB, um, now the Pro League. So I've worked with uh, I've worked with Arnold. I spent a day in uh, Arnold's uh, office in on wow. Santa Monica. Um, That's cool. We, my, you know, my law firm represented Sly Stallone's nutrition company when back when he wow. had. It. So for me, as a kid who grew up, you know, idolizing bodybuilding and and those icons, you know, I actually became more involved through the legal channel, I think, than I ever would have been had I taken the more traditional approach. You know, Rick, it's often said people look at you differently than you look at yourself. Almost always. You know, it's, it, you're with yourself all the time, so you lose a perspective. But I feel I'm talking to the go-to guy. Like in your, in, your, in your profession, in the niche that you carved out, because there's many different ways to practice law, obviously. You're like, you're like Arnold for that. I mean, you're, you're like the guy that come, you're, you develop top of consciousness, which is very powerful. You, you, I don't know if you advertise, doesn't matter to me, but you probably don't have to depend on that anyhow, right? A lot of my, a lot of my clientele comes through word of mouth. I mean, people know who I am. And if, if you're in any way involved in performance enhanced substances uh, or in the uh, business of selling supplements that are maybe on the on the darker side of gray, so to speak. Um, you probably have me on speed dial, or you should. And and I love what I do. Uh, I know the territory. There aren't a lot of criminal defense lawyers who would know an anivar from an aspirin. You know, I mean, they it, it's it's outside their wheelhouse. They can deal with cocaine and heroin, or you know, a uh, domestic violence case, or whatever. But there's very few lawyers who really know this territory. And so, you know, whether I'm in a courtroom in New York or a courtroom in Florida or in California, if it's a steroid case, when it comes to sort of the the subject matter of the case, I'm going to know it backwards and forwards. And so I get hired to come to I've, I've traveled this whole country. I've had 
steroid uh, SARMs, peptide, research chemical, tainted supplement cases all across the country. And, um, and I love what I do. I'm, I'm lucky enough to be able to, to be a criminal defense lawyer that typically doesn't represent people who've hurt people physically or even right. economically, which is, which is so rare for a criminal defense lawyer to be able to do that. Um, hey Rick, is that, and, is that part of your? Is that part of your? Is that often part of your argument, or your, you know, how you sew it up, or you present it to the judge? Look, this person has never been in trouble. They're not making any money. Uh, they're not hurting anyone, but perhaps well, some themselves. of them do make. Some of them do make a lot of money. But oh no, that's true, right? But um, but it's not like they're making money through fraud or through stealing it, or you know, or something. There's a victim who now is, you know, out their money because they invested in some land scheme. And so, so those aren't my cases. My, my law partners, I've, so I'm, I'm the unusual one in my law firm because I've got partners that do bread and butter criminal defense and personal injury and car accidents. So we've got a, you know, a, a firm that has many divisions and, um, and is a, a full service law firm. But for what I do, I am so grateful to be able to to represent a, a clientele that I can identify with, that identify with me, that I think like me personally, and I like them personally. They're they're my clients are very often the guys that that I would you know be spotting in a gym or or would ask to spot me in a gym, and that that's a that's a cool thing, you know. Very so, cool. Uh, I'm 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 grateful, obviously. I, my practice both gets people out of trouble, you know, if they're in trouble and keeps them out of trouble. And so we, we do a lot of work in the dietary supplement industry, claims and labels and trademarks to make sure that, you know, plaintiffs, lawyers or trademark um, holders don't come after you. But and I enjoy that, too. I enjoy working with supplement companies all the time. And I do a lot of that. But but there's no feeling like you know, taking somebody who's basically a good person who maybe is a bodybuilder, maybe got involved in in using steroids and then ultimately, you know, ma making them, you know, importing the raws and, and setting up a little little, you know, kitchen chemistry set uh, and then selling them. Um, and it's really the only thing they ever did wrong in their life. Very often, most of my clients have no prior criminal record of any kind. And so to take that person and, and, and do everything that I can possibly humanly do to try to save that person from a fate that sometimes prosecutors would like to see them have is just, that's a challenge for me. That's exciting for me. And that's gratifying for me. Rick, um, I literally have at least one guy watching this and he's potentially in trouble with some of the aforementioned, you know, hopefully he'll, you know, I'll talk to him after, but for those who are watching or maybe watch because they can watch this in perpetuity, what's the first thing they should do? Call me. So okay. you, I'll tell it's 516-294-0300. I'll, I'll type it, I'll, I'll type it in the description. All your contact will be in there. Awesome. And, um, and if people have questions and, and we'll cover some stuff tonight, but we're, there's lots more. If they go to my website at steroidlaw.com, steroidlaw.com, they will be able to see there's a blog there. There's plenty of information. I, I know there's blogs on Osterine. There's, there's blogs on, you know, your rights in mailed packages. Lots and lots of stuff there. They can go to Steroid Law. They can contact me through there. Uh, I'm also very active, as you know, Doc, on, on social media. Yeah. So whether it's Instagram or, or Facebook or LinkedIn or, you know, Twitter, Rick Collins ESQ is, is a great way to sort of find me a, across the different platforms. And um, I'm not hard to find just, you know, I have, I have a friend who has a little card. Uh, actually, I, you know, you, you had him on the show, uh, Rayhan, Rayhan Jalali. Oh, I love Rayhan. And, and Rayhan was, uh, he and I have had many, many adventures together. Yeah, and, he's a great guy. Uh, he sometimes hands out a little business card that he made up as a goof. And and it's it's his name. And simply his contact is Google me. That's oh, nice. It. That's smart. That's, that's actually pretty it's, smart. It's hey, Rick, cute, um, Rick, that being said, so you're, the dynamics of your practice, it sounds like you stick exclusively to what we're talking about. You don't do any of the injury stuff. 
you're the guy for the supplements and the PEDs and things like that, right? Yeah. I'll some uh, occasionally I'll take another type of criminal case, and I and I've had some some wacky ones, and and some I've enjoyed. I've enjoyed, but um, by and large, I'd say ninety five percent of my criminal caseload is in this sort of bodybuilding fitness wheelhouse. I, I've represented doctors who have been involved in prescribing testosterone or anabolic steroids in a manner that either law enforcement or a medical licensing board thinks was not for a medical purpose. Uh, I've represented athletes who were accused of doping. Um, in some cases, they did. In other cases, they didn't. I represented a boxer by the name of Sam Solomon. I don't know if you've, you've heard of him. He was number one middleweight boxer in the world. Nicest guy, Australian guy, um, and a uh, funny guy. And um, he took a dietary supplement that he bought over the counter in a legitimate, you know, dietary supplement, you know, natural product store, uh, asked the manager of the store, you know, in his, his Australian accent, I might, I might now, come on now, I can't test positive, you know, I'm a drug tested athlete, so I can't take anything bad, or you sure this won't mess me up? And he was assured, that's my best Australian, he was assured that, uh, oh, good. There, was, <laughs> that there was nothing in there. And he actually had the manager call the manufacturer of the product in a different country. And I actually got the phone record showing that at the time he was in the store. That was the due diligence that he used before he took that product. Lo and behold, that product caused him to test positive for a, you know, a little known stimulant. And, um, and he wound up beating a German, the German champion in Dusseldorf, Germany. Then, you know, had the had his um, his purse taken away, uh, wow. failed the test afterwards. I wound up being uh, called in, and so I was rep I was one of the team of lawyers that represented Sam in his fight against the Germans. It was like World War Three because uh, wow, the yeah. Germans, you know, they didn't like their their guy losing the fight to the Australians. And so, um, so they wanted to disqualify him and not only take away his purse and his, his winning the fight, but take away his ranking, which wow. would have pushed him so far down Money. that he, he wasn't a young man. And so, you know, he was, he was closer to the end of his career than, than the beginning, and it would have been devastating. We wound up fighting, and um, I actually demanded a sample of Sam's urine, and I had it sent to a lab here to test and my theory was he never should have been tested for that particular substance because the bout agreement did not provide for that. And so he really didn't test positive. They, according to the, the rules, so to speak, he was in compliance. And so I asked a different lab to test according to the rules that were set forth in the bout agreement. They came back. They said, well, then by those rules, he's negative. So I did a huge wow. press release. Sam Solomon exonerated. The Germans went ballistic. How could you say that? You know, he 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 tested positive. You know, you you tested for the wrong things. And I'm like, no, no, no. You tested for the wrong things. You did. And so ultimately, I was able to get Sam's ranking back. He fought that same German again. He beat the German again wow. without any issues. And then he went on. To his next fight was a million dollar purse. So wow. Sam went out in style. And uh, and none of that would have happened if we hadn't really aggressively fought back. You know that 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 could be a book or a movie because it was a good outcome. Yeah, it was <laughs> a great outcome. Great. I got outcome. I got and one of the invited me. He invited me out at the tail end of his career. He fought out in Washington State, and he he invited me out there to see him fight. And just just a, a great guy. Really. Good That's guy. cool. You know, speaking of great guys, you said Sam Sam Solomon. I thought you said Dan Solomon, who I just had on here. Uh, uh, I think. Another but, great friend of mine. I don't know if if, if um, Dan got to mention it, but Dan and I um, ha are new board members of the International Sports Hall of Fame, which wow. um, was the last. You know, the Arnold. You probably heard this. You know, the Arnold. They a lot of it was canceled. The trade show, the expo was canceled, but some events still went on. And one of the events that went on was the in the induction ceremony for the 
International Sports Hall of Fame, which is run by Dr. Rob Goldman. Bob right. Goldman yep. does it, and, and, and he does a fantastic job. And, um, and his, his main uh, assistant, you know, uh, who does all the heavy lifting is a guy named Fairfax Hackley. I don't know if you know oh, yeah. Hackley. No, I know who he is. Just a fantastic guy. And so um, Eric Hillman of, of Europa. Yep. And um, and Dan Solomon and myself were the new new board members, and uh, I got to to give the award to Johnny Damon. Um, wow. And so so it was just that was fantastic. And then within a week of that is when everything hit the fan. When you know the coronavirus just went off the charts, everything started locking down. You're in Connecticut. Here in New York, we're still pretty locked down. So, nice. I see um, yeah. you know, our gyms are still closed. Um, you know, I'm Rick, training in my basement as best yeah, I listen, can. I don't have to tell you, I'm not training. I don't have anything here. I will say this, and you, you would likely have this type of mindset because there's two things. There's positivity and optimism. Positivity is kind of BS. You just push yourself through the day. Optimism is you can see past the din that's going on right now and know that you're going to be in a good, everything's going to be in a good place again. So I say all will be well. And for the people who are just so down all the time, I say, well, if that's how you think, why why are you getting out of bed? So you gotta we gotta fight through. I don't know how long it's gonna go. I mean, we're still here talking, you know, the lights are still running, there's still things that could be done. It's certainly disruptive to say the least, you know. Well, you could look, you could look at the negatives in every day. You can look at the, the good things in every day. Every day may not be good, but there's something good in every day. Oh, yeah. and, You've got to try to find it and and make the most of it. And, um, you know, when we mentioned Alpha Male Challenge, that was a book I wrote a a few years ago with a a well-known fitness author by the name of James Villapeg. And um, it's it's sort of a men's self-improvement book. It's diet, it's exercise, it's mindset. Um, when When you talk about longevity, it's a book that's really dedicated to sort of extending out your most active, robust, vibrant years for as long as you can you can keep them going. Rick, and, forgive uh, me. And a lot forgive of it me. is mental attitude. So much of it is mental. What you're hearing uh, attorney uh, Collins speak of right now is what we uh, define here. And the book is Alpha Male Challenge. I just bought it off Amazon. You guys can do it too. Um, support uh, the cause. And it's good information. You always want a little more information than you had beforehand. That's the most potent thing. Spies kill for it. Uh, Stephen Ross, great broadcast. We appreciate the info. I don't know what happened to defend us. I think he went back to get his notes on those old members you asked him about. (laughs) Here's a question. Here's a question because, you know, a lot of people in the industry, you know, like you, you have a lot of passion for what you do. It it comes through. We can see that. And, uh, And you've been able to ingrain bodybuilding into your business. So not only are you truly offering value and helping people, you know, out of terrible situations, but you're making you know a great living supporting a beautiful family uh so you're you're plugging all the gaps and of course there's difficult times so you have a lot of people in bodybuilding and fitness and you know sometimes they don't come forth and uh uh, admit what they really want to do you know maybe they want to go into hollywood or they want to have a company or or maybe they're just afraid but even a guy like me i'm 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 beginning uh uh putting together a cbd product okay and we were talking off camera um it's just going to be one product to start with my longevity company uh, as it's growing. Um, you, you look at a company like EAS. They were very, very successful, obviously. They only had six or seven products. They focused on stuff that we, they really had success with. Then you can look at Twin Lab. You know, I'm not saying they're good or bad, but they've had a thousand products. So there's different spectrums. But a guy like me sitting in this office, uh, what would I do? I can call a guy like you and you can help me how. So, so CBD is probably the hot, hottest ingredient out there. I don't go a week without getting a call from a, a company who, or, or a, a new entrepreneur who's like, listen, Rick, I want to come out with a CBD product. I want to, you know, whether it's a, a topical, some type of cream uh, or an, an oral uh, product, a, a supplement, a, a pill of some kind. How do I do that? And uh, there's, there's a lot to sort of unpack when it comes to CBD. And I've done some you know, one hour lectures on CBD. The in a nutshell is that. Rick, excuse me. This is for, this is for you. When you do one of those lectures, so you do these things, information, how do, how do people find those? 
you know, go go back to this. But remember, I asked you that because people, you know, I would go to one myself. Sure. Oh, absolutely. So, um, so well, as far as the CBD goes, um, a lot of people are confused about it. Uh, a lot of people think it's perfectly legal to sell CBD as a dietary supplement ingredient because there was a, a change in the law, uh, what they call the Farm Bill, the 2018 Farm Bill, that basically said if there's a very small amount of THC, less than 0.3% of THC in a product that it is no longer to be considered a controlled substance. So the DEA has got to, it doesn't have jurisdiction because it's hemp, it's not marijuana. And so that was a, a hemp specific act. The problem is putting all of that aside, the DEA is, is placated, so to speak. But the FDA has taken the position that CBD is not an ingredient that they will recognize as a lawful dietary ingredient in a dietary supplement. So from FDA's position, and they've sent out warning letters to companies that market CBD products, most, not all, but the vast majority were to companies who are making disease claims. By that, I mean, you know, there are some companies that say some crazy things about CBD. You know, if, if you come out with the CBD product and you say it's going to cure somebody's cancer or it's going to you know, prevent a heart attack or any sort of drug claim, a disease drug claim, you're going to get an, a warning letter from FDA. And if you don't stop, then, then worse things can happen. So FDA's position is still anti-CBD. However, you can go into virtually any mom and pop drug store. You can go into a, a you know, convenience store. You can go online and you can buy C thousands of CBD products that are available to consumers. And so you're looking at that and you're saying, well, you know, Rick, how, how could it be illegal? Because, you know, it's, it's literally everywhere. And that's FDA's big problem now is that they've taken a position that all of that is illegal, but they're not really acting on that in any significant way to chill the market. There's a few warning letters here and there, but it's not really changing things. And so most lawyers in this area believe that at some point there's going to have to be some pathway created for a legal CBD type of product or product lines to be able to come out and get to the consumers, whether it'll be limited in terms of the potency or the serving sizes or how much comes out or what the age of consumers should be. Obviously, there are, there are concerns that FDA has expressed about it from a safety standpoint, including, you know, how much is too much. If you start taking a CBD gummy and CBD cereal for breakfast and a CBD, CBD drink at lunch and, you know, CBD, CBD, CBD all day long, at some point, could you take in enough that you would test positive for THC right, on right. an athletic drug test or if you're in law enforcement or something like that? So these are things that are going to have to be worked out over time. I think the genie is out of the bottle and it's going to be extremely difficult for FDA to put it back into the bottle if they're really dedicated to that. But, you know, I've got my finger on the pulse of sort of how things are going um, and so anybody who's interested in getting into that market can certainly call me. Uh, I get a lot of calls on CBD. I, I still get calls on SARMs. And I, I don't know if you've covered, you know. Yeah, we were going to talk about that. But, you know, you just helped me with questions. I will call you. Um, but let me ask you a question as far as labeling and claims. Well, it's like being on the Internet. I'm a licensed physician here in Connecticut. I see a lot of people. Listen, the egregiousness, the egregiousness that I see. I don't give any advice on the internet. I, I offer information. There's a difference, I think. Sure, they, I, cannot, I cannot give advice, either ethically or in good conscience. If you're not right here with me, somebody, you know this, somebody say, well, I've got this pain in my back. Now, if I suck, and I do a lot of things, sucking for the most part is not one of them. But, you know, if I suck, I'm going to say, well, you sprain your psoas muscle. That could be an infection from the prostate. It could be a process from the kidney. It could be cancer. Who the hell knows? So that's why that being said, as far as message delivery, develop a product. Is it okay to say this helps with versus it's a cure? Because I know the cure is a very dangerous word to yeah. use. 
Yeah. And, and, and that's one of the things we do is sort of help companies with the language, you know, of what supports something rather than prevents something. Right. And so, um, but the devil's in the details, you know, um, inflammation, for example, everybody's concerned about inflammation these days. If you put on a supplement product that it, you know, resolves inflammation or, or helps with inflammation, uh, inflammation would be a disease state without saying more. So FDA has a problem with that. But if you qualify it and you say inflammation as a result of exercise, for example, That's everything right there. Ah, well, now it's not a disease anymore. And Correct. so really the devil's in the details. And that's why it really is so important for any dietary supplement marketer to speak with an attorney before the products come out, you know, not after, you know, we've, I, I've seen all sorts of ways that supplement companies, especially new ones, screw up either because they put claims on a label that they shouldn't have or have marketing in a magazine that they with language that they shouldn't have or in some cases don't do the proper trademark searches don't protect their intellectual property infringe on somebody else's intellectual property so those are things that we help with all the time i've got a lawyer that i work with who does uh, lots of trademark and contract work her name is shannon montgomery great great brilliant and, and a bikini competitor oh, i read that yeah i read that it's, you know it's hard for me to find lawyers to to work with that have a similar passion and, and ideology so um so i'm very lucky to have her so, uh, hey, Rick, so we Rick, do a lot of work what kind of shape is the average attorney in physical shape i can tell you about doctors the piss poor yeah. shape they're in <laughs> you know it's it's funny um uh, i i just finished the presidency of the nassau county bar association yes. Congratulations. It was a high honor and I loved it. It's it's one of the largest. I think it's still the largest suburban bar association in the country, something wow. like 5000 lawyers. So I was the, you know, the leader of that during a very difficult time, which was the the whole lockdown coronavirus pandemic thing. Um, and now I've been asked to work on a task force with the New York State Bar Association specific to attorney fitness and not fitness to practice fitness in terms of physical fitness wow and so uh, so i'm working on that and and it's a recognition that you know lawyers are very stressed they work long hours they you know it, uh, sometimes they're sitting at their desks all day um if they're trial lawyers there's a lot of stress involved and so they don't exercise many don't exercise as they should many don't eat as they should and so you've got you know, like in, in other professions, but but certainly with lawyers, you've got health issues. So um, so we're going to work on trying to to give a get lawyers healthier, get them more fit. Um, you know, I, I I've trained throughout this pandemic. I, you know, I I'm, I bought I was one of the lucky ones. I got a um, a Bowflex, uh, and this is not an you know, I have no affiliation with Boatflex, but it was <laughs> okay. an adjustable dumbbell set that I managed to get just before they sold out of them and they became very hard wow. to get. So it goes up to 52, 53 pounds. Look, you know, I'm not setting any records with it, but it's enough with some push ups. And, and I oh, yeah. saw Chef Rush on, on your show the, the yeah, other sure. day. And, and, and I actually, I was hanging out with him a little bit at the, at the Arnold um back in um in march and you know i'm standing look you know i'm i'm 230 and i'm you know i, I work out a lot and you know suits are hard i see you push, you push you push heavy weight i push some heavy heavy weight but but i felt like i was a four-year-old kid standing next <laughs> to chef brush his He's arm gigantic. was bigger than my waist i mean it was like <laughs> utterly ridiculous you, you saw him uh, and he he does push-ups galore. I mean, he's, he's a huge yeah. push-up guy. So if I can have a chest like this, so I've been doing a lot of push-ups and um, and and what I can with the dumbbells. And uh, you know, look, it, it's working. I you know uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to keep making gains until they they put me in the Rick, box. You know, Rick, a somewhat a somewhat rhetorical question. Um, what time do you train in the morning? That's not really it. But would you be as successful and have the energy for all of your various endeavors, obviously your your, your main business as well, if you didn't train? Let's say you foresaw all of that, got, you know, stopped, you know, turned to whatever, lost all your muscle. Would you still be where you are now? 
No, no. And, and, and you and I have talked about this before. And I think that being a bodybuilder gives you a skill set that makes you more successful in anything that you do. And particularly being a competitive bodybuilder, having gotten, you know, having done the, the contest prep, having gone through the meal prepping and the sacrifices, the, the dietary sacrifices, the, you know, the not going out with your friends because you got to get up and train or, you know, uh, not wanting to blow your diet, you know, the, the getting up early in the morning. And I used to train, you know, the, after, after pumping iron, I trained to Valencia health club in Elmont. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but that was Steve another, the Valencia. one in California. No, no, no. It was in Elmont, New York. Um, I have heard and, of that. Um, you know, it, it wasn't, you know, it, it was a, a, a great gym. It wasn't huge, but it was, it had great equipment. Eddie Perez, Lenny Vinod and Bobby Strom um, were all involved there. And uh, Eddie was the one who did a lot of my contest prep back when I was competing. And, you know, I, I think that what you learn from, from bodybuilding, specifically contest bodybuilding, is discipline, is sacrifice, is is patience because you're not you're not going to get a 20 inch arm in a week you know you're going to have to work at it day in and day out week in month in year in you got to be in it for the long haul it's commitment and rick would you would you sorry would you would you agree with what our friend john romano said on this channel he said i asked him what what does it really take and he goes you must and this isn't very sellable but you must suffer you yeah, think so? I, yeah, and 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 I will say, John, John is uh, a, one of my dearest friends, oldest friends in this industry. I like John. Uh, John actually, you know, um, John um, brought me in to write for Muscular Development Magazine when he was the editor in chief of of yep. MD, um, yep. close to twenty years ago. Yeah, nineteen years. And he um, he he's the one who really pushed me to write Legal Muscle which was the book that, that I wrote in 2002 that, about steroids in American law, culture, politics, sports, you name it. And, is, that, is, um, that, is, that, is that still available also on Amazon? It's, it's, I, it's, out of, uh, people, it's out of print, but people say they find it somewhere on eBay. And eBay, yeah. It probably costs a lot these days. Yeah. But there are, some, there are some issues out there, so a few left. But, um, but yeah, so John really, really pushed me to write that book. And that book really, really put me on the map and, and has allowed me to do the, the kind of practice that I have now. Um, and um, yeah, so in terms of suffering, yeah, I, I, I think so. I think there has to be a certain amount of suffering, uh, sacrifice. I might call it sacrifice more, but you can't have everything. You've got to make your choices. You know, you want to go out and party with your friends when you're 20 years old, go out and party um, and, and don't train the next day because you're hungover. Uh, or make the sacrifice and you know get on stage and and show yourself at your best. It's also problem solving and, and being creative and yeah. and working ways. Look, you get an injury. There's nobody who hasn't had an injury in bodybuilding, and or or it's a weak point. It's a body part that's lagging. You've got to come up with ways of training around these problems and without stopping training. You know, I tore my tricep a number of years ago. And um, uh, I was back in the gym in less than a week in a sling, training everything else. I was training the other arm, and I had great training partners. I still have great training partners over at Bev's. It's a great gym, and I, I give a, a shout-out to my training partners, my, my posse, my crew. They're, they're great guys. <laughs> but but uh, they, would, they would load hammer strength for me, and I was able to do one arm chest, one arm shoulders, one arm lateral raises, one arm pull downs on hammer strength equipment is great for, you know, one arm unilateral training yep. because, because another friend of mine, Ron Norman, I don't know if you know, Ron, uh, what's his last name? Ron Norman, Ron Norman. Norman. I don't think so. No good guy. Um, and he had turned me on to some research, which I further looked into that there is a contralateral effect to yes. unilateral training neurologically. Yes. So you, the you fibers training, cross. You're yes. training that left arm. True. When when that sling came off on my right arm, 
I had very little atrophy. Wow. And it came back. I, I think my my tricep is is as strong, if not stronger, than it ever was. So wow. uh, Neil Watnick was the, the doctor who reattached it. He did a great job. And I'll also give a shout out to Mike Camp. I don't know if you know Mike. Mike What's is his name? A, a C-A-M-P, Mike Camp. Mike Camp. And, and Mike Camp is a physical therapist at Beth Page Physical Therapy, works with a lot of the, works with Sadiq, works with a lot of oh, the top, yeah. top athletes. Um, and so, um, you know, I was back in the gym training it in, in far faster than I ever imagined I would. Rick, we, I, I do have some questions that people I posed to me earlier. One guy, how can there still be – I talked to a couple of trainers in the gym, and they say, you know, you can still get pro-hormones. I'm like, what do you mean? Well, they furtively sneak them in. They change one step in the chemical reaction. That's number one. Is that true? Number two, your thoughts on – well, it's mostly marketing. I don't buy it as far as over-the-counter – and they're awfully expensive in some cases. Over-the-counter HGH and testosterone releasers. Yeah. What can you talk – tell us about those things? So, so – there's there's always going to be and I, I i've talked about kind of the the evolution of the of the black market kind of in in you know performance enhancement um it's an interesting thing it's you know originally back in the day back in the 70s and the and the 80s there was a you know a, a market small market for uh anabolic steroids but they were mostly diverted pharmaceuticals, prescription FDA approved diverted pharmaceuticals that friendly pharmacists or doctors would kind yeah, of, yeah. you know, yeah. backdoor out to folks. And I think is that, is that what you mean by is that is that what you mean by diverted? Yeah, diverted okay. from you know more legitimate. So, so they were legitimate products. It was FDA approved right. product. It just wasn't going to people who needed it medically. It was going to people who wanted it cosmetically, right. aesthetically, so to speak. And then when, when the uh, Anabolic Steroid Control Act of 1990 took all of those steroids and put them into a classification uh, with other drugs of abuse as a controlled substance, the legitimate pharmaceuticals kind of dried up because Big Pharma, you know, was no longer interested in really marketing these controlled substances. And so then you had a lot of veterinary. You probably remember the, the, the day that people used to talk about uh, veterinary steroids. There'd be pictures of horses or, or cows, you know, hey, on these hey, Mexican. Hey, hey, Rick, my father, I don't know if he does anymore. Uh, my parents are still with us, thank God. But he used to watch horse racing. I remember when I was in my 20s, I was over their house. And all of a sudden I heard it was the Equipoise Mile. That was the name of the race. <laughs> Equipoise, as you know, is exactly. a horse steroid, but it's, it's, it's in high regard from the bodybuilding community. Isn't that yeah. true? Yeah. Well, yeah, EQ is still very popular, but, but you know, so, so the market diverted. And, uh, and then when, you know, those sort of bringing things into the country as finished products, the, you know, customs started cracking down on that. Now Homeland Security. Now the market became powders imported from China which would be brought over here and then made in a, a kitchen chemistry process uh, and then sold, you know, made here in underground labs. And that's a Rick, lot of my clients now. The legal, the legal end here, I want to go to China in a second because I think it's relevant, especially now. Yeah. In 1990, uh, prior to 1990, if you were to get your hands on a bottle of Anabar without having a prescription, you somehow got a hold of it. Was that considered a, a crime? Not really. Before ninety, no, it wouldn't. Be. No, no, no. So it wasn't like that. No, it was. You know, I wouldn't say they were like super vitamins. There was something beyond that, but they weren't controlled substances. A cop wouldn't have known what to do with it. There was no DEA jurisdiction over it, so it, it was nothing really. Uh, once, once the Anabolic Steroid Control Act took effect in 1991, now all bets were off, and then most states. Some states had already made it into a controlled substance, so in certain states, you already would have had a problem. But but until the late '80s, and then ultimately federally in 1991, um, you know, once that happened, then you know, it, it it was like heroin or cocaine or or LSD or or right. Vicodin. You know, Schedule Three, cocaine is Schedule Two. 
but still, you know, a, a serious charge. So, well, Rick, um, let, me, let me let me ask you. Let me present this, and I'm sure you have your thoughts on this. And you may have even posed this. I read a lot of your stuff; just can't always grab it all. You, you, you know, you look at plastic surgery. Somebody wants the rhinoplasty, or they want breast augmentation, or they want some liposuction. How is steroids, which is, I, I guess, what eighty percent of the illicit stuff is is used for cosmetics and people who don't compete? Yeah. You know, how's that? How's that different when you think about it? Yeah, I mean that that's the argument, right? That's the that's the argument for um, for sort of looking at steroids as something closer to a cosmetic type of process than it is a you know an illegal drug taking. Um, right. You know, Congress made the decision when it scheduled it that it was a drug of abuse and that there was a potential for addiction or dependency. Um, you know, I'm not sure I everything is potentially training is uh, is addictive to, to people. So you could get dependent on virtually anything. I've never been really that impressed by that research. Um, I think there's there's a strong argument that steroids you know, would be something that could be put into the arsenal of licensed, educated, knowledgeable physicians to use in a judicious way for um, cosmetic enhancement. I think that probably could happen. Um, and in some ways, probably would be safer than what it is now, which is a black market where people don't go to the doctor, where people get products that are not FDA approved. They don't get you know, monitored. They're not supervised. They can use excessive doses. They can have side effects that go um, you know, unchecked. So you know, look, steroids do have potential like any drug. I mean, there's bad things can happen if you take any drug, particularly in high doses and for long periods of time, you know, obviously oral steroids have some hepatotoxicity to them. So, you know, so there's issues, you know, they, they should be in the hands of doctors for sure. Um, and I guess you, you have to look at, you know, is the, the current system really working? You know, is it, is it making it safer for people who do use it? Probably not. Is it keeping it out of the hands of athletes? I don't think so. Uh, is it keeping it away from children? I don't think it's it's we've lost control in many ways. It's called the anabolic steroid control act. What we we've lost control. So pro hormones you had brought up sort of came in as a kind of a, a loopholed way of getting around the anabolic steroid control act, and that's still happening in a way. You know we've we've had a we're now on our third version of the anabolic steroid control act called the designer anabolic steroid control act, which you know each time tries to eradicate the pro-hormone market more effectively. Um, this latest time, they've added in a whole component about marketing substances. So if they're marketed for muscle growth and they fit certain generalized criteria, that would be enough to go after them. So, um, so each time they, they try to crack down and each time chemists try to wiggle around and make some molecular adjustments, to try to get around it. Um, and the devil's in the details on these things. Anybody who's who's sort of playing that game better read that Designer Anabolic Steroid Control Act, you know, word for word, because, you know, the devil is is really in there. I'm going to feed you three things because I'd, I'd rather not cut in. I hate doing that. Just I, I, I like to hit upon details sometimes. I read you all the time. I watch you in action. And I, I like how... Forgive me if it's not the right description. You kind of come across as ambivalent, meaning you don't commit yourself to 100% bad, 100% good on either side. You know, you're not like these are bad, you know. And then I'll, I'll segue to Jerry Brainham. You know Jerry. Sure. Yeah, Jerry Brainham, uh, well-versed in all the nuances of this stuff. You know, Arnold still calls him for nutrition advice. And he competed in the 70s. And he says he was clean, and I have no reason not to believe him. But he does say today, he says, if I knew what I know now, that old leveraging of information you gain in a lifetime, he said, done judi judiciously, uh, I'd have no problem using them now. You know, if, right. if it, you know, it's the real stuff and you've got the, re you know, that, that's what Jerry says. And, right. you know, like, to kind of echo what you were saying, 
you know, there's always a, everything's created for a reason. Everything exists for some type of positive use. And finally, and then you can tackle all this. Speaking in terms of you're talking about the, you know, the powers that be employing these, these new uh, laws and rules. I don't know if you touched upon this, but, you know, steroids cause aggression. See, I don't know if I buy that. I think my, my take is if you're already aggressive, it may amplify that. But is there an inherence to it that would actually make you aggressive in your opinion? So I, I, I usually like to say that if you're a, a jerk from, from get-go at 180 pounds, you know, and now you're 240 pounds, you're going to be a bigger jerk off. I mean, <laughs> that's, the, that's the reality. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think some people who get involved with taking steroids, not obviously not all, but some of the people who, who do get involved in it are people who maybe were insecure from the beginning. They're looking for a shortcut. They, they want to get bigger. They want to, they, they've been bullied. They, they now want to throw their weight around. And so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that now they, now they are bigger and stronger. And if they were looking for trouble, they're now able to dole out a lot more trouble. Um, you know, there's in, in cases, and there have been some cases, isolated anecdotal cases of people who, you know, have done crazy things while on steroids. Would they have done crazy things otherwise? Never know. What's the role of pre-existing mental illness in it? Don't know. Uh, what about other drugs and alcohol? You know, Chris Benoit, for example, they made that out to be a steroid case, but there was alcohol everywhere. Uh, then they did the, the autopsy. They found out that his brain was like Swiss cheese from all the concussive trauma. So, wow. you, know, uh, you know, there's 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 a lot there. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not overly convinced uh, about the the idea that um, that roid rage is something that is common among bodybuilders. You know, there are some people who tell me that they're more edgy uh, when they're on than when they're off. They, they feel like they have a shorter fuse. Uh, not, not all, probably a minority, frankly, but then, but then you don't know if they're like low calorie or something like that. And you don't know if maybe their estrogen levels are, are right. Are. I mean, there's, there's a, it's complicated. So, you know, it's very hard to say, yeah, yeah. It's the, it's testosterone levels or it's the steroids that did it. Rick, um, here's something interesting that you could, I'm sure you could address you have a case that's exclusively PEDs, but then as you hear, oftentimes, not just bodybuilders, but athletes, there's a, there's a heavy narcotic component to their lifestyle. And when you have that mixed in with the PEDs, maybe this is an obvious question, I don't know, does it make the case a lot harder? Well, it depends on what, what the case is. You know, I found most of the clients that I've represented who are you know, let's say underground lab guys who are who are making, you know, taking raw powder from China and esterifying it and and make putting it into you know bottles and you know vials and and putting stoppers on it and and labeling it on a home you know printer and selling it on Reddit or on on Instagram. Most of them are not big recreational drug guys. Not. Most of no, uh, that's that's not what I find. You know, I think there are, I think there's some research that actually says that you can categorize steroid users into sort of different, you know, buckets. And one bucket is this bucket of guys who are health conscious. Maybe they're dissatisfied with their natural progression. They start using steroids. They, they like the effects, they become converted, they're, they're believers, and so they start making some stuff for themselves and then for some friends, and then, hey, this is a way to make some money, uh, but they're not big rec drug guys. Then there are also the steroid users who are just, you know, there are some guys who just love drugs, <laughs> you know, <laughs> whether, it's, whether it's cocaine or, or whatever, yeah. and so you know, yeah, I'm a cokehead and, and yeah, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to get, be a jacked up cokehead and I'm going to have bigger muscles. And that's, that's a different profile. I don't see that in, in what I do as often. I think the media would maybe some people in the media might like to make that more prevalent. You know, wh when I look at what the media focuses on with steroids, it's usually two population. Well, 
it's it's the roid rage issues certainly if they can find an anecdotal somebody who did something crazy and and was on anabolic steroids then they'll blame the steroids as opposed to all the other factors as in chris benoit but but it's usually either cheating athletes you know whether it's a you know a professional athlete an olympic athlete whatever so so now there's a there's a stigma of cheating. There's an ethical, unethical, an ethical, you know, lapse that's attributed. And that's always been sort of a, something that's put a stigma on anabolic steroids in a way that is not on any other sort of cosmetic improvement, whether it's breast augmentation, liposuction, rhinoplasty, we could go on and on. These are cosmetic procedures that have no ethical Nobody's saying you're a cheater right, because you got right. breast implants. You know, is it an advantage if you're a stripper? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, d- depending on what you do, sure. You know, but nobody really looks at it that way. Yeah. Um, but with steroids, even if you're not competing, even if you're just doing it, hey, look, you know, um, I'm 40 years old. I've just gotten divorced. Maybe I don't feel so good about myself. You know, uh, I, I'm not making any gains in the gym anymore, and, and I would love my doctor to prescribe this for me in a reasonable dose, monitor me closely. Um, the doctor would go to jail if he did that, and the, the guy would be viewed as a cheat. There's an ethical component to it, and, and I'm not sure that that's really ever been fair. The other profile, and, and whenever I get calls from journalists on the phone who want to talk to somebody, they'll say to me, Rick, we'd love to talk to one of your clients. Really? Okay. You, do you have like a teenager who's on steroids? Do you have somebody like 15 or 16 who's on steroids? And I just hang up the phone because I know what they're trying to do. The reality Rick, is... I'm, I'm just going to stop. I'll stop you for one second, then go on. Because I just want to show you, uh, that was... Um, an article that I did for the New York uh, Daily News. And the only reason they came to me, I had my clinic at the time, a town over from here. I had a very, tying into your teenage statement, I had a very high population of high school athletes who wanted to do steroids and their parents would come in and ask questions. And, right. and, and they knew about this. This was uh, the 2003 baseball steroid trials that you may want to address. But I did get questions. I had a, a girl call me from MTV. It's the only reason I interrupted because you mentioned this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she asked me, can you get me a teenage girl who is 15 that uses steroids that will come on camera and reveal herself? I go, this listen, I you know, I know two things, I know two incontrovertible facts. There is a God, I'm not him. I can't do it. But that they only were interested in tawdry and then their other thing was if you read this article they talk more about creatine than actual drugs creatine right <laughs> well there, so, there's also i i'm sure you've seen them too there are the journalists who call creatine a steroid so yeah, yes, yeah. how many times have we read mainstream articles where creatine Still. is described as a steroid yeah right here and, and there was also years ago there was a uh one journalist uh, you know i guess cr- stupid lazy journalist printed a story and then others, what happens, it's almost like, you know, wildfire. One journalist puts a story out there and others pick it up. And the story was that young girls are using anabolic steroids as young as nine, as young as nine-year-old girls. And so it was something that was terrifying to any parent of a middle school kid. And so, hey, it's going to sell. So that became the narrative and it went rampant, you know. And so I started getting calls about these nine-year-old girls who are who are using anabolic steroids, and I wrote a column in in Muscular Development called "Barbies for Boldenone. and so <laughs> yeah, it was because it was so ludicrous, and and the mainstream media very often will you know we could we could go on about all the things that are sometimes ludicrous that are that are put in some of these uh, mainstream media reports, but steroids is just one great example of a a narrative that's been out there for years and years and years, which really doesn't comport with the facts. And and what you said before about balance. Yeah. I'm not pro steroid. I'm not anti steroid. If if you've got HIV wasting, you should be on steroids. These, these are, this is great for you. 
if you're hypogonadal and you've got the testosterone of an 80 year old woman, you need to be on testosterone. You need anabolic steroids. That's these are this is good. You know, if you're a 14 year old kid who you know has some you know bullying issues and is you know very insecure and wants to use steroids because it's a quick fix and that I'm going to show them I'm going to get back at everybody. Steroids are very very bad. Don't don't use them. So it really depends on the context, right? And and certainly there's a difference between. Do you, do you know what a difference journalist? between two hundred milligrams of, of testosterone a week for for a, a man, and two thousand milligrams of, of of gear a week? You know, if you you could do bad things and hurt yourself. So the the devil is in the details, and that's why I get I kind of get back to the ideas it probably should be doctors who are involved in this process and not, you know, not somebody who's cooking it in his, on, on, you know, pie tins in his, in his oven. That's probably not where it should be going. I want to talk about doctors in a second, but Brady Henderson has a question for you. Heart disease is our number one killer. Do you believe steroid use exacerbates this or could it? Because it's a case by case, obviously, but what do you think? You know, um, I've had hey, this discussion a lot, and, and you know, the disclaimer: I'm a I'm a lawyer, not a doctor. I think, right? To, to paraphrase, you know, Scotty on on Star Trek, you know. But you you, uh, you may play you may play one in a movie eventually because we'll talk right. about that. Maybe. You know, Denise, Denise and I were already. I don't know if we could do this. We're going to try to find everyone. Rick is one of the stars of the movie Toxic Avenger too. And you can even look them up on IMDb. I have all I have all these panels in here, so I can like research. You do your everything. research. I, you yeah, know, oh yeah, I real research. Pull, I can't no pull double, anything no, over. No on double you. blind studies in this place. Um, and we're gonna try to get it on next Netflix tonight if we could. Wow. All right. All right. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I've had this discussion with a number of of physicians who I who I do respect, including I don't know if you know Dan Gartney. Uh, oh yeah. Who's written many years for for MD and yeah, great know, shape. And, and, and he's in fantastic shape and he competes. And, um, you know, his view uh, it has typically been that most, most of the side effects attributed to steroids are overblown to, to a large degree or, or exaggerate. It doesn't mean they're not there, but, but they're contextualized. It, it, could, it, it relates uh, to, to dosage and what type of, obviously, hepatotoxicity is for orals and not for injectable. So there's, most of them can be qualified. His main concern has always been sort of the heart issue and the potential cardiac issues, um, in particularly in high doses and particularly for long periods of time. He's always expressed that and he's done a number of columns sort of on that. And he's, he's, he's also not an anti-steroid guy by any means or a pro-steroid guy. He's a, a pro-truth guy pro right. facts and truth, which is sort That's of way way that I've always put myself into. Um, and that is a concern. But it's interesting because while high dose anabolic steroids may have some cardiac negative effects and and he's convinced that that there, there probably are negative effects, uh, particularly for a long period of time in a high dose testosterone replacement at like 200 milligrams or 100 milligrams a week, the research on that does not suggest no. that TRT is harmful to the heart. Quite the opposite. It right. appears to be, you know, and, and that's an interesting thing because yes. the old saying, the difference between a medicine and a poison is the dose. Something yes. at, at one dose is very good for you, but something, if it's the same thing at 10 times, 20 times, 50 times the dose can be very bad for you. You know, speaking to a lay person, and compared to you, I am regarding this, but if I were to be speaking to a patient and they asked me, I'd say, well, look, you could take a you could take a vial of heroin. I don't even know what that comes in, but let's say the equal amount of heroin to maybe a, a 10 milliliter vial of testosterone. You could stick all that testosterone in your butt in one shot, you're going to have a sore ass, and that's about it. Take all that heroin at once, you die. And then I tell them, I go, you know, it's more so, I know several guys that I can think of right now, they'll just matter of fact and tell me, well, I've been, you know, and they're doing it on their own. It's not TRT. Right. High levels of testosterone for 10 or 20 years straight, never getting off. And I'm sure you know people like that. Right. Sure. 
Yeah. And, and I've heard that up. I've heard that heroin analogy actually used with a bottle of aspirin, right? So oh. You take a bottle of aspirin, you just down it, you know, you you may not wake up, you know, a bottle That's correct. Of, so um, you know, so in Obviously, I'm not saying aspirin is more dangerous than than anabolic steroids, one way or the other. But but, but it's accessible. You know, immediate you don't overdose high. potential. There is no real threat or or worry of no. steroid overdose because you 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 could take a a handful of Dianabol and probably get a, a gastrointestinal you know discomfort. But right. but you're not you're going to wake up in the morning, and the same wouldn't be true if you took two bottles of aspirin. Right. Well, you know, going back to the, the test over time, higher higher hematocrit, thicker blood. Um, uh, then you have a, a higher resting blood pressure, uh, kidney failure. So, but people will press it like, well, that 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 testosterone is going to destroy your kidneys. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't go right. To, it's not like a target. It's all these other collateral processes that occur. Going back to these journalists that disseminate this ludicrousy, you know, that, that people, uh, you know, that they believe and they end up buying and then they're misinformed. That's why I like your, you said you're not this way, that way. You're more truth. What is the truth? You know, what can we finally find it somewhere, you know? Yeah. And, and, and the truth in, in is hard to find in almost anything these days, anything. right? Because the, the, everybody seems to put a spin one way or the other on whether it's political issues or economic issues or medical issues, steroids, anything, you know, sifting through it all to come to some, you know, objective, unbiased information is is hard to do. Uh, I've I've seen means, you know, media reports saying, st you know, testosterone is bad for the heart. You know, it, it very dangerous uh, based on a study. And then I've actually gone over that study myself and looked at the actual data specifically. And I and to to make sure that I'm reading it right, I talked to my friends who are very, very knowledgeable doctors. And the actual the study doesn't say what they claimed it said at all. In, in some cases, it actually said the opposite. Um, and so sometimes you have to really do some diligence and you have to look at the, you get down into the weeds because the spin this, this, put on things is not necessarily the truth. This is a huge point on one of my sites. We, I, 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 I iterate, I reiterate this. I say, be your own lab. And I don't mean be irresponsible, but you know, take a look, look at the studies you're, you're, you're reading. For instance, you, I, I guess you have to be well versed in many studies, conflicting studies, you have to cite studies. I think you have to be careful with that to, to get the right ones, the ones that you can back, and you know what I'm saying to prove a, a case or a point. You know, and how and how and right, how, how do you find the good, the real ones? Because you've got you know corporate interest money, investigator bias, cherry picking. You know, because when you cherry pick, it doesn't mean you're lying, but you're leaving out some other yeah. things that can. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's it's so common, you know, and and who's funding the study? Right. You know, if, it's a, if it's a drug company funding the study on a drug, does that mean it's probably going to be more likely to be positive for the drug? Well, the researchers are probably not going to get more gigs if right, they right. if they start coming out saying your, your drug is killing people. So, you know, <laughs> so that's a problem. And so you look at who's funding the studies on steroids. And very often it's the World Anti-Doping Agency or others with a vested interest in the opposite direction, that these right. are bad. You know, uh, Scandinavia has done a number of studies that have been used to say that steroids do connect with violence or aggressive behavior. You know what population they studied? Prisoners. So, you know, talk about, you know, skewing it from the start. You've picked a population that is probably not representative of, certainly not representative of the steroid users that I know. So, you know, you can, you can rig a study from the start and then, and use it to validate, you know, to essentially to confirm what your original hypothesis was. Hey Rick, let me ask you: Why do you think uh, that the, the the testosterone levels in the American male population have gone down an average of one percent a year for the past thirty years, or so I read? 
Yeah. Um, we actually covered that in alpha male challenge. You know, that was sort of one of the, um, one of the, the, the reasons that we wrote the book was that, you know, American men are sort of losing their, you know, their manliness, you know, their maleness. Yes. It, you know, yeah. Maleness and manliness, you know, it, both, both metaphorically and culturally in a lot of ways, yeah. but, but also physically, you know, and so, yes, you know, studies when they, when they've done retrospective studies, what they found out basically is that our fathers had higher testosterone levels than we do on average and that their fathers, our grandfathers, had higher testosterone levels than our fathers did. And nobody really knows why. There are different theories. There are phthalates and, you know, chemicals in our diet or, or a million reasons that, but it's all speculation. And there's really nobody who knows why they're, they're getting lower, but they are getting lower. So we've got this, you know, longitudinal, you know, over generations of lowering testosterone. And then we've also got the individual lowering testosterone because after the age of 30, everybody's testosterone levels on average as guys, it's, it's, you know, you hit your peak and then it starts to go down. So at 40, your levels are less than they were at 30 usually. And then at 50, they're less than they were at 40. And so, you know, Alpha Male Challenge was sort of our way of kind of trying to reinvigorate and reignite, you know, the, the alpha male attitude, the alpha attitude for men as they age. And there's, there's a whole section, for example, on courage, you know, on, on exercising courage like a muscle. If, if you don't use it, it's, it's going to atrophy. It's going to go away. You know, I, when I was just starting to write it, um, you know, I've never had an issue with heights. And when I hit like 40 or so, I remember being up on the roof, doing some work on my roof and getting this like kind of queasy feeling, you know, I never had before just getting a little, you know, uncomfortable with heights. So, you know, I, I confront, I'm the kind of guy I'll, I'll confront. I'm not going to accept that weakness. I'm going to find a way to overcome that weakness. And so I scheduled a skydive, which is something that I never really thought about. A skydive? A skydive. A skydive. Did, did, did you have it, Rick? Did, did, did you have this in a magazine? I, I saw this I somewhere. I did. Okay. So I, I, wrote, I wrote about it in Muscular Development. And, I saw that. And I did it for charity because I figured, God forbid, yes. if it goes bad, at least I'll be remembered kindly, you know? So, see, uh, Rick, if it went bad, I don't know who I'd be talking to instead no, of you, you right be now. To me now. Who, who would be? Who would be? The, who would be the new legal muscle? Maybe your, uh, maybe your associate, the bikini uh, competitor. Maybe maybe I, I, I got to groom somebody. Yeah, if there's somebody out there, call me. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, so I, I did it, and and I, I did a out of tiny little plane. You go up thirteen thousand, thirteen five, yeah. and um, you know it's a tandem jump, and you you do your you, you do it out, you, you jump out of the plane. And I got to tell you, it's uh, those final moments are pretty scary. You know, are they? when you're, you're kind of, do you ever do a skydive? My 80 year old mother has, but I haven't. <laughs> well, you should, you, I tell everybody, you should do it. You should do yeah. it. It's, it's the kind of thing I think everybody should do because you, and, and I tell people, the more frightened you are of doing it, the more you get out of it. So if you're wow. just like an adrenaline junkie and your feeling is, yeah, I'm going to do it. I was great. At, you know, OK, it, it's nice. But if you're the kind of person who's terrified of, of heights, of, of, you know, falling out of a moving airplane and <laughs> you, you're, you're, you know, you, it's the last thing you'd ever want to do. If you do it, if you find that inside yourself to be able to do it, to overcome everything and there is that moment when you're about to go out and you've got your tandem instructor with you and you're you're about to jump out of the plane just sort of like rock out into this you're looking at the curve of the earth you're you're looking wow. down you know two and a half miles and and you're saying to yourself you know what statistically this is going to be okay statistically right right it, it's going to be fine but in that 
possible one in a million that it goes bad, you have to just be able to say, F it. F it. That's right. I'm in. And, and when you say that and you rock out of the plane, it's almost like you've got to be willing to, to let it all go. You got to be willing to, you're taking that chance that it could go and you're just going to release it. And it's such a catharsis and it's so empowering when you land and you were going to land safely, realistically, you were going to yeah. be fine. But what, but subjectively when you land, it is as if you have kicked death in the nuts. It is as if you have, it, it's almost a feeling of such empowerment it's almost like immortality has been bestowed on you it's an amazing feeling hey, Rick, you know, I'm, 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 now. I'm now a licensed skydiver oh are you really i am so, i'm laughing now because the way you describe this is so um you're so plugged in that it provides this picturesqueness like i'm almost doing it you know you 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 know tell me when you're ready i'll, I'll oh, i will hey rick the original premise though you were talking about low t over time and you hit 40 and maybe that was relative to having queasiness um, but the point was, and many good points, but, and then we got a, a, a question here from Brian again. Um, yeah, like you said, it's, it's, it's imperative to keep it high enough because of all those, you know, all the, all the comorbidities that go along with having resting, even doctors who some just don't know. Most of them don't know. They'll say, well, we're going to give you hundred milligrams every two weeks. I'm like every two weeks. Right. The serum going, your blood serum levels doing this sinus wave are yeah. more less healthy than just keeping them low in the first place, right? Well, certainly certainly the the dangers of hypogonad uh, hypogonadal condition, you know, from cardiac, uh, from from depression, from just everything, you know, certainly low T is a dangerous thing. And, you know, being in that mid-normal, healthy range, you know, I'm not saying being 2,000 nanograms per deciliter or, or, you know, some of my, you know, clients maybe are well beyond that. And that's not really? necessarily, you know, a healthy thing. But but to be in the normal, high normal range, yeah, no, it's it, it's it's a great thing. And, and if you're feeling bad, you know, the, a doctor should be able to help you. The problem is a lot of the traditional endocrinologists just you know, they they they've read these these you know abridged versions of studies that have been you know trotted out there to say, you know, testosterone is bad, and so if you have a even if it you're you're at like three three twenty, let's say, which is very on the on the bell curve is very very low. low. Yeah. They're like, well, you're normal. That's uh, exactly I'm not, what they say. I'm not going to give you. Well, are you crazy? Get out of my office. You know. Hey, Rick, Rick, I had a, I had Troy Zuccolato on here. You know Troy, of course. Sure, but, uh, I do. Yes. With his youth tech clinics, very successful. He made a good point, and I think I you could do this. I, I know I could do this. He could just look at someone, and you know their physical countenance. You know their their, their skin is kind of doughy. They have this look. Their head hanging. He, you could tell that they're low T. Just looking at them. Now that's not a, a clinical diagnosis, right. but projection is also part of good health let me let me read brian semple's statement here our largest gym in Qu quebec city is going to defy the government and open next week the owner has good lawyers i know you're in the states but i believe some have done the same in your country i'd like to know what you think of this yeah well look i come from a, a perspective of of uh, a, a gym rat in new york who has been without a gym for three months and, and training in a basement. Um, and here in New York, gyms are the final phase. They are the last phase of, of reopening. In wow. other states, they were in the first phase. So yep. it's, it's, you know, um, it really depends on where you are. Um, and it depends on what the state rules are. You know, in some states, you may have seen there were gym owners who, you know, were arrested. A guy in California was actually arrested. He was um, on here. I had him on here. That's uh, uh Mark Pacheco. Mm -hmm. He's yeah, still open and, too. And and Lou out in San Diego area. So so there's um you know, look, I I would never recommend that somebody you know violate the law in a way that if if it's if it's a uh, a specific ordinance that you could be arrested for, it's a problem. Um, do I agree 
that gyms should be closed? It's it's a tough question. You know, on the one hand, you know, it's the way that it makes you healthy. You know, you'll be stronger. It builds your immunity. Training is good. You know, staying in your house and hiding is not going to make you well. No. Um, on the other hand, if you had a packed gym where everybody's breathing on everybody else, particularly at the height of the contagion, um, you know, th that's probably not a good thing. I, I saw uh, they, they raided different places for the potential for spread. And they've claimed that gyms are higher because the the heavy breathing and expulsion of air goes further than it would if you're in the dry cleaner and you you just walk in and and you're there for two minutes when you pick up your your dry cleaning and leave yep. in the gym you're there for an hour and you're expelling a lot of air. So look, th there's there are issues there, and I say this as a person who is not who wants the gyms open today, you know, but I recognize there are some issues there, but I think that they could be uh, solved by separation of equipment, by, you know, titrating who comes in and how long they stay and how close they get to other people. And the fact that in many places, gyms weren't allowed to even, you know, try to set up something that would lower the risk, you know, is something you know, I, I, I'm not wild about it as a person who really believes in training. I have to mention Mark Pacheco was not arrested. He got closed down and then he reopened. Um, uh, yeah, it was Lou Uridel out in. Yeah, uh, no, I, yeah, he did get arrested, huh? Well, wow. yeah, he got arrested. He got, I mean, you know. Would you, would you represent, I mean, would this be out of your uh, arena representing a, a gym owner who got, I mean, would they even need that? Would it just be a fine or what do you think ultimately would happen? I guess it would depend on the jurisdiction, what the potential uh, risks would be. Um, but I, I think they're backing off that now. They are. And I think we're kind of at the point where, you know, I would say within the next three weeks, everything will be open, probably countrywide, unless there's some really crazy spiking. You know, some so I, I've heard that there's some spiking in some places um, who maybe opened up too early. So, um, you know, I guess they'll have to look at that. But I, I think here in New York, I think within three weeks, I'll be back in the gym. Uh, although go. under, you know, there may be, you may have to make an appointment that you, know, there may be less, less foot traffic, less, less members at a time. I'm willing to work with that. I'll tell you, you know, and, and this, I think is the difference between an intermediate trainer and an advanced bodybuilder. And that is the, the intermediate trainer has to use as heavy weights as he can use to keep growing. But I think you reach a point where, where you've been training long enough that you know how to schedule a workout, how to, to, to plan out a workout so that you can make the most of it. I only have 52 pound dumbbells, but I feel like I'm making gains in my basement, yep. you yep. know, uh, I, I've, I've, and whether it's, it's, you know, time under tension, you know, sp you know, um, uh, shorter rest between sets, higher reps. I mean, there's many ways of intensifying a workout other than just, slapping on a few extra plates yeah I, I think at this stage especially for us as older guys i think that um you know we probably give our joints a rest and our tendons and ligaments a little rest yes. by you know by not just and i i do i train very heavy i like training heavy if you go to my instagram i'll, I'll post some of the some of my training videos but i i use i like to use a lot of weight but I feel like, you know, at this point, I don't necessarily need to. And no. I may make equal gains or maybe even better gains because I've trained heavy for so many years that if I train a little lighter now and I concentrate a little more and, and I use the mind-muscle link more, um, I also save a little bit. You know, I, I think we probably all reach the point where we're on borrowed time for our shoulders. And oh, our man. Guess, but let's face it, you know, I have a friend who says, you know, that if you take terrible care of yourself, when you get older, you're going to need a cardiologist. If you take excellent care of yourself, you're going to need an orthopedist. I love that. I right? love that. Why but, did I ever come up with that? It's <laughs> true because, you know, 
if you eat like like garbage and you you're a sedentary individual, you're gonna have all sorts of cardiac problems. But if you train like a beast and you you throw iron down and you're 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 really into it, you know, body probably wasn't meant to be benching. You know, my best bench was 440 at at 220. So I got a a double body weight bench press. That was the you're, most not, you're not. You're not. You're not. You're not quite up the chef, uh, Andre. No, no, no. Nor am I. I'm, I'm literally the size of Chef's tricep. My whole body. <laughs> no, no. But, when I say next to Chef, I'm a. I'm a tattoo on his neck, man. I got nothing going. <laughs> and he's such a nice hey, guy. Hey, he is the oh, nicest, great guy. nicest guy. I love him. If he's listening, I'm, I'm saying hello to him. I think you're my 27th podcast, and I have to say, to me, it's important to have. People who are nice, good character, they come across well. They truly want – you're one of them. He, everybody I've had, I've had a couple of requests. So I've had a lot of luck. Nobody's told me no. I feel like we get almost anyone. There was a couple of people, you know, they don't really – I'm not going to say anything bad about them. I don't say their names, but I'd rather not have them on as guests because they, they kind of don't come across well. They don't have the best track record as far as people talk about them. So we just don't go there. Um, but, you know, in practice, historically, all the patients I've seen – Back knee, I'm going to tell you it's worse, shoulder, because shoulder has so much range of motion. With all that range of motion, you screw it up, look at everything you lose. Do you agree with that? I mean, yeah. you're starting to shoulder stuff. Yeah, it's, it's a There's complicated a of- joint. You know, the whole ball and socket thing. And, you know, now I've heard some guys, Dave Palumbo, who I'm sure I'm sure you know, Dave, yep. you know, Dave, Dave did the reverse shoulder replacement, but then yeah. you, you, you can't really use any weight anymore. I don't think, I don't know. That's I, I don't think that would work for me. Um, well, speaking uh, of that, the reason one of the reasons I mentioned that is you put a, shared a really good article with me. Maybe you could touch upon it because we're, we're almost done. We've done a lot here. I just want to mention a couple of things. But that HGH article, uh, there's fi- finally coming around. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So uh, basically, you know, to give a, a, a very quick history lesson, at the time that anabolic steroids were made into a controlled substance in 1990, there were people who wanted to take growth hormone and also make that a controlled substance because athletes were using it and maybe it was, you know, they they were going to get an advantage and it's cheating in sports. So they wanted to do the same thing. Pediatric endocrinologists said, whoa, 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 no, no. That'll stigmatize the short statured children. So instead of making it a controlled substance, they put growth hormone into its own little box, its own little law. And the law that it's been put into is so restricted that the FDA's position is that growth hormone can only be prescribed for a very, very limited number of uses. Injury repair, recovery from trauma, recovery from surgery is not what is on that list. So you can't prescribe growth hormone for any of those things. And so there's very little research into it. And so years have gone by, that was 1990, and now here we are. And I have always said, you know, listening to people who anecdotally say that they've taken growth hormone and that they their recovery was faster after an injury or a surgery than it would have been. I've also said, you know, there should be some research on this. Somebody should look at whether people would recover more quickly if growth hormone were an adjunctive therapy to physical therapy, et cetera, after an injury or a surgery. Nothing happened for years and years. And then a couple of years ago, Mark Cuban um, spot, you know, basically funded research. Now, he used athletes. I think it was ACL repair. Um, but he used athletes as the, as the subjects. And some with ACL repair were given growth hormone. Some were not. Randomized, double-blind, you know, placebo-controlled study. Um, and that's now just coming out. And... There's some indication, and and I know you've had Scott Stevenson on, and and you know he's looked at it, and he's not overly impressed with growth hormone. He's more impressed by some peptide, you know, fractions of growth hormone, as as some others have have also been. But um, but certainly we're now finally getting some research done because if in fact I'm not saying it is, but if in fact growth hormone does help you heal faster after you've I'm put athletes aside. You're a mailman. You fall off the stoop. 
now now you're, you're, you're injured, you're, you break a femur, you tear your quad, whatever it is, you got to get back to work. The sooner you can get back to work, the better. The sooner you can be healthy, the better. If growth hormone or, or peptides or any you know, um, some, anything that's, that's not currently allowed to be prescribed uh, for that were to be allowed, I don't see a problem with that. We could still keep it out of sports, you know, all of that stuff. If, if that's the goal, it shouldn't be, you know, our concern about cheating in sports becomes the tail wagging the dog if people who would benefit, patients, medical patients who would benefit from a medicine can't get it because athletes use it to cheat. That, to me, that makes no sense. Well, like the, the old guy could even be me. Everything hurts. You get up, you feel like you just played an NFL game and you didn't. I got Pete Koch on uh, Monday. You know Pete? Uh, played in the NFL. Uh, he was in uh, yeah. these movies and stuff. But uh, talking yeah, about yeah, I saw that on your page too. Yeah, yeah. You know, so much pain. And I've read anecdotally as you've sp- spoken, uh, guys taking HGH and it's like magic. They don't feel the pain anymore. Yeah, you know, the, there's been an anti-aging application of it for years. Even though, again, you know, FDA says no, no to CBD. FDA also says no, no to HGH for any kind of anti-aging or age management. They specifically say that's that's not something doctors should prescribe it for. It's not allowed for that. Obviously, some doctors do, but, you know, uh, FDA is saying no. Finally, one of the final things uh, I want to mention, in light of the way things are now in the world, and from what you hear, and you reference this, you know, powders coming from China. Now there's all kinds of embargoes and trade restrictions and who knows what else with China. I'm assuming that a lot of that's going to be cut off. I know Mexico's been cut off. And I'm talking about the guys, you know, unfortunately, this is a big part of it. You know, not literally, but making making the stuff in their bathtubs. What happens now if that gets cut off? Because people yeah. still, you know, want to get their stuff. You know, um, I, I've often said in, in some of these interviews, there's a certain percentage. You know, we've been fighting the drug war for for 40 plus years at this point. Um, you know, drug usage rates pretty much haven't changed that much. So we've been fighting a war that, you know, it's hard to actually quantify any success to it. That's and that's true. because I think there's a certain percentage of people who want to get high. And that that is going to continue however you legislate it. There's, you know, there's going to be a demand. And hey, Rick, hey, Rick demand. some of those people might even be on Capitol Hill. We never know. <laughs> but, but, but that's, you know, with recreational drugs, that's the way I see it. And with steroids and performance drugs, it's similar. I think there's a certain percentage of the human genome that wants to get jacked. That's what they want. That demand is there. That demand will never go away. They want to be bigger than life. They want to be bigger than what nature will allow. And as long as there's that demand, there will be that supply, whether it is finding alternative sources, whether it's, you know, a deeper black market out of China, whether it goes to Eastern Europe or somewhere else where it's been before. Um, There's always going to be a demand and there'll always be a supply that comes to it. I think SARMs, which we touched on a little bit. Oh, Brady, 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 I'm sorry, Brady Henderson just asked, we hear a lot about steroids and HGH. Do you have any thoughts on SARMs? You read his mind. They're all over there. So so like SARMs and pro-hormones were were alternatives that were demanded. And so the, the demand is there. So the supply appeared. Um, you know, uh, SARMs, you know, selective androgen receptor modulators, for those unfamiliar with it, these are chemicals uh, synthesized in a lab. Uh, some of them um, are in, you know, drug pipelines to be pharmaceutical drugs. Uh, others are just, you know, these, these chemicals that are not allowed to be prescribed or um, available as drugs. And so um, one of them is osterine. So they're available in two ways. Uh, there have been companies that have sold Osterine um, and uh, and some other similar SARMs uh, as dietary supplements. And 
they don't qualify for the definition of a dietary supplement. So, so those companies, some of them have gotten in trouble. They're probably still out there as dietary supplements, but there's a risk to those companies selling them. The other way that they're sold is as research chemicals. And you're probably familiar with this, Doc. There, there's yeah. this whole market out there yeah. uh, that bodybuilders, it, it's in your face, that bodybuilders are aware of where different types of ancillary drugs that bodybuilders use, um, some of them are, you know, um, Viagra knockoffs, Sildenafil, or Vardenafil, uh, others are, are, you know, fat burners, Clenbuterol, others are tamoxifen, clomiphene, you know, different types of drugs that ameliorate or prevent side effects from steroid use or whatnot um, that are available not for human use for people to buy. For, and it'll say right on there, SARMs, not for human use, you know, for research purposes only. And those companies have gotten in trouble for selling them um, because it's, it's the theory by the government is it's fraud. You're, you're saying it's not for human use, but you're selling it to people under circumstances that make it obvious that the only people who would be buying it would be people who were using it for human use. You're not, you're saying it's for research. You're not selling it to research labs or to institutions or academic places. You're selling it. You're, you're taking an order from young and huge guns at AOL.com and shipping it to his <laughs> college dorm. So, you know, there's, there's issues there. So, uh, it, you know, broader than that though, is I've represented a lot of people who sell SARMs on, you know, in both of those categories and some of them, look, the black market is a place where there's good and bad, and you take some risks when you take something and inject it into your body that you've bought from somebody who made it in their kitchen. And I have clients that are meticulous, they're fastidious, and the quality of their SARMs, of their peptides, is as close as you could get to you know, GMP compliant, you know. Um, but I've also had clients who were not so meticulous. Uh, I, I can think of one situation where, you know, the the order was from China. It, you know, he, when he was making it, he kind of mixed up two chemicals. So what he was selling as one arm was actually something else entirely. So people were taking something thinking they got an apple and they were getting an orange. And, and that's the risk that you take. You know, there's no legal pathway for these SARMs or for many of the peptides, some of the peptides that are out there. And so you take your chances, you know, with what you get. Rick, quick, quickly, is, is the penalty, I mean, again, this is another broad type of question, but let's say you got somebody who's selling, you know, fake gear and they get busted on that. It's very damaging to a lot of people. Is there any way out for them or they're just going to have to take the hit or what? It depends on the circumstances. Uh, I've, I've represented people on fake gear cases, um, you know, and uh, it, it depends on all the circumstances. I've had fake HGH cases. Um, you know, I, I will say that most most of my cases, when I see steroid cases, it's it's not fake gear. Um, and I know Bill Llewellyn. I don't know if you've had Bill on on the show. Yep. If not, yeah. Right. So I've got his book. Yep. Bill's great, and 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 Bill has done studies to kind of look at you know counterfeits and how much is real and how much is fake, and it kind of varies over time. Um, but um, I, I've certainly seen underdosed products um and yep. i've seen you know products that were purporting to be one thing but were actually another um so um e even in terms of you know uh clomiphene tamoxifen and and you know uh, uh anastrozole you know letrozole issues so you know again th this is this when the black market is the way that people get something and there's a substantial demand for it some sometimes the black market creates a lot of problems and the the effort by the congressmen and legislators to crack down on some 
something actually kind of backfires and it causes problems that may in some cases be more significant than if you had taken another approach. Everything that Rick is talking about tonight, Attorney Collins, is uh, basically we're talking about longevity. That's the end result. You want to look good. You want to feel good. You want to keep those t telomeres in your body lengthened. The longer they stay long, the longer you live and you live well and you age without getting old. When can we call you uh, the Honorable Rick Collins? It seems like a normal progression. Yeah, I, I have no interest in the bench at this point. I, I love what I do. Um, I should mention that anybody who who's interested in this whole steroid issue and wants to see yes. a great movie, I don't know if you've seen Bigger, Stronger, Faster, but it's a great yep. documentary uh, by a good friend of mine, Chris Bell. I'm in the movie, but don't see it for that. See it because it's just a great documentary, and it really covers – it covers a lot of the territory that I covered in the Legal Muscle book in a very visual way with a great narrative, a great story. So I highly recommend that. You know, Doc, I, I love what I do. I don't intend to stop at any time soon. Um, I like traveling. I like I like my clients. You know, if you go to some of my social media pages, a lot of the people who follow me are past clients. You know, and the, and and they tell other yeah. clients. You know, to to hire me, you know, if you go to my re review sites, uh, Avo or, or lawyers.com, you can see reviews. My clients, you know, and I get along really well. I think they know that I fight for them. I think they know that I don't judge them. I, I understand them. I'm, I come from a similar background. So I'm the, I'm the, I got an attitude of gratitude, Doc. I, I'm the happiest. Well, that, that, Rick, that, 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 that. That comes across. I have Chris Bell scheduled for this show. I watched the movie oh, twice, awesome. saw you in it. I also recommend uh, C.T. Fletcher's movie. He's come. C.T. is coming on with um uh with Chef Rush. We're gonna have them together. And well, uh, good, that'll I'm be a fun good company because you're getting you're getting a lot of A list. Yeah, no, I love it. Hey, Rick, I'm like you. I'm still I'm still a doctor, and I I'm you know building a longevity business. But like you, I like to do what I like to do, and if I, I can involve it in a helpful way. I, I know very little, but what I know, I know real well. And I dropped ego and dogma a long time ago because it's the only way you're going to get to where you want to go. And you mentioned it earlier, progressing slowly over time is the key. So we get guys like you. And, and you know, I, I surprised myself that you'd even give me your time. You look at your social media and you can see that you're having fun. But people must know that there's a lot of hard work always, not always smiles. And to stay where you are, you're always working hard. You don't. You, you're not like Mr. Peanut with the cap, smoking a cigar, chilling I think for two he died. days straight. I think uh, Mr. Peanut died. That rest is rest. Oh, is did he? Yeah, I think he did. Hey, speaking of that, I'm very sorry about your little dog. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. She I, I was what? Two, eight, Eighteen years old. He, he, yeah, yeah. He was uh, he was seventeen and a half, and. Um, you know, he, he outlived a lot of his contemporaries. Back in the day, uh, Dave Palumbo used to come over to my office. He had a little dog named his, Bella. His little he, dog. Would bring, he would bring this little teacup Maltese to my office, and uh, and I'd bring, you know, Mr. Lucky in, and, and Bella and Mr. Lucky would, you know, play and chase each other and all that stuff. And that was that had to be like 15 years ago. So, yeah, and he just died last year. So, um, yeah, I miss him. He was my first dog and um, ever. So, so, uh, there was a cool bond there and, um, you know, I, I do miss him. I, I posted a couple well, Rick, two things, a little, you know, a little mug with him on it recently on Instagram. Oh yeah. I showed that today. We love pugs. You know, the funny thing was at the time, Palumbo was probably the biggest bodybuilder in the world. He had like this little dog, right? He did. That was, yes. Yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> hilarious. Hilarious. You know, my dog is, uh, just like you mentioned, Fozzie, he's 20. He's a cockapoo. Only dog I've ever had. He's been with me as long as I could remember. Uh, and I, listen, knock on wood, my parents are still, I haven't had anybody close to me pass away. And I'm That's 56. That's amazing. You're, you're, you're so very I'm, close. That's, I, I don't think I've even Rick, heard listen, that. Listen, I'm, I'm very cognizant of, that, uh, cognizant of that every day. I'm grateful. I mind. I visit everybody. I'm not going to be that guy. If I make it, having regret and all, I, I won't. I can't. You know, there's still going to be sadness. You think your dog is still sadness, but, you know, you gave it a good life. You, you know, it's an extension of what you do for all the people. It's just what you do. You know, you, your sphere of influence is one of goodness. And then you got a very nice wife and two dogs, right? 
I do. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Life are, they, are they in school or are they, are they, are they going, my are they older, going in the my law? Older one, uh, my younger one is in business. My older one is in law school. So she's, she's following in those footsteps. Well, there's who's going to take you, take over for you, man. She'll be the, the, the new uh, steroid I'm lawyer. Possibly. Protege. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> hey, Rick, well, I really want to thank you. This was great. Uh, we had a lot of good questions. Hey Rick, give me give me contact number. I put everything else in there, but what is your contact? So, yeah, I'm easy to phone find. Phone number. The the phone number is 516-294-0300. You know, people can keep it on on speed dial if they ever need me, either in an emergency or for anybody who's starting a supplement company or involved in a supplement company or has a legal problem uh, in sports nutrition. Certainly, reach out to me. Anybody with you know, in a, as a drug tested athlete with questions or problems can reach out to me. I love what I do. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to chat with you. It's always a lot of fun and uh, maybe we'll do it again sometime. Absolutely. And um, I'm going to be contacting myself over the uh, BD product because we are going to move on that. And anybody here, listen, Rick is not only a good guy, a good human. I'm glad that people are like him are out there just that we know there's still people building and doing good things you can see a lot of bad all the time but use them as a resource i know a couple of members contact me kind of on the down low what should i do you know sometimes they're slow to pull the trigger rick you know that they don't call right away or they got to hear it again and again but don't wait because if you have a problem it's like that irs bill that comes and you just keep the envelope there without opening it it's just going to grow and grow and grow and that's going to have a big problem and i can't help you with that so Rick, thanks again, man. I'm going to shoot you a note. I want to thank everybody here tonight. And tomorrow we'll be here with another friend of yours, John Hansen, natural Mr. Sure, no Universe, Mr. Oh, Olympia. Very cool. Good stuff. Rick, somebody, nice. somebody called me a bodybuilding historian. I said, no, 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 no. That would be John Hansen. He knows. Yeah, <laughs> John Hansen real and remembers really me just from yeah. 30 years ago. Good All right, Rick, good night, man. Uh, be well and continue to go forth and conquer. Thanks, Thanks so much. Be well. I'll see you online. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you.